have um, both offstage and on stage an incredible array of entrepreneurs. As uh, Fadi Gandur and Maher Kadur walk in, hello. Uh, welcome to everybody. Um, we're delighted uh, at the Abraj Group. Um, my name is Fred Sikre, that's where I work at the Abraj Group. I'm a partner there to uh, have pulled together um, a, a fantastic array of uh, entrepreneurs with uh, uh, various experiences, uh, a very diverse experiences, many of which have traveled um, from very far away to be with us today in Dubai. Um, I'll start very quickly by introducing them. Um, Ron Bruner, who's right here, who uh, on my right, who um, was an entrepreneur uh, on the commercial side of things, having started his own business in the real estate uh, sector in the United States. Uh, and having been very successful at doing that, then transformed himself a number of years ago into becoming a social entrepreneur uh, in the Arab world and having created uh, uh, an organization called Education for Employment that he will tell you a little bit more about. Chris Schroeder, um, who, as you can see, has been a very successful entrepreneur. That's why he has no more hair left. Um, uh, that's a measure of success. Uh, but um, Chris is a serial entrepreneur, um, came from uh, Washington, D.C. to be with us, much like Ron Bruder did as well. Uh, very well-known entrepreneur, mentors entrepreneurs, um, uh, is the co-founder of uh, healthcentral.com in the United States, uh, and is also an avid writer, uh, reporter, and you will find him uh, and uh, writing quite a number of articles uh, in many publications that uh, are well known throughout the world. And he's right now in the process of finishing a book uh, that is looking at entrepreneurship in this part of the world. Is that right, Chris? Yeah. Next to Chris is Naif Al Mutawa, um, the founder of Teshkil. I think many of you will uh, have seen um, his 99 uh, superheroes uh, gravitating uh, across your screens or across your children's uh, classrooms or bedrooms. He founded uh, Teshkil uh, a number of years ago uh, and is now embarking after many years of hard work into a very successful venture, taking his 99 superheroes alongside Batman and Superman, uh, fighting terror and evil around the planet. Adil Ali is next to Naif. He is the man who built Air Arabia into being one of the most successful uh, low-cost carriers uh, world, by worldwide standards today. Uh, many industry observers have uh, ranked Air Arabia as one of the most successful, most efficient, uh, most productive low-cost carrier um, amongst the sector. And uh, we have an interesting sort of entrepreneur in a corporate sense uh, that is with us here in, in that respect. And last but not least is Faisal Al-Banai, um, who is well known in this region as having uh, founded one of the leading uh, telecom and, uh, and uh, electronics retail uh, businesses uh, across this region. So a very diverse group of people, uh, and the idea is to try and have a discussion with them on this issue of entrepreneurship across the ages. Entrepreneurship, um, has it changed? Um, uh, what did it take to be a successful entrepreneur? today compared to 10 years ago? What does the future hold for us? And how does this region need to evolve in order to be more entrepreneurial friendly? And I'm going to start by asking um, Chris and then Faisal uh, Albanai coming from two different perspectives. The first question, which is, um, how has entrepreneurship evolved over the, the last 10 years, uh, Chris and Faisal? Uh, speaking to the markets that you're familiar with, I don't know if Faisal wants to start, um, but remembering that about 10 years ago, we were coming out of the, or we were in the anti-globalization uh, moments. Um, there was a lot of uh, movements on the streets and in society against businesses, big institutions. We had just gotten out of the dot-com boom. Uh, the Y2K had proven to be a... Uh, uh, a uh, a non-scary, uh, impactful uh, bug never occurred. So that was about 10 years ago. So how do you see uh, entrepreneurship having evolved over the last decade, Faisal? And Hi. I think we have to speak very loud because there's a lot of... Uh... I guess so. 
Thank you, Fred. Um, I guess over the last maybe 10 or 15 years, uh, definitely there were a lot of constants for entrepreneurs. I don't want to go through that, whether it's risk taking or it's trying to be innovative or uh, any area related to creating your business. I guess what's really changed or has been changing in the last 10 or 15 years is probably, if I'm referring to our region and some of the regions around us, is probably some of the infrastructure around entrepreneurs to support entrepreneurs. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, compared to today, whether you see organizations like uh, Dubai SME or Sheikh Khalifa Fund or whatever, today more than before, you see more supporting infrastructure, at least around SMEs. Is it enough? I think it's still far away from enough in, in that regard. But whether it is to help them in funding, whether it's to help them in guiding, whether it's really to help them to kickstart their business. So 10, 15 years ago, I guess what was available from in the time we started our business or other people started their business compared to today, I definitely see that area evolving much more than before. Especially in the last two years, if you want to call it, there has been a, a bit of democratization to the support infrastructure. What I mean by that is, if we take funding, today, in the past, you had to go maybe to banks or to your relatives or to someone to fund you. But today, with websites like Kickstart, some of you might be familiar with, some of you not, with websites like Kickstart, where if you have an idea, you launch your idea on that website, and suddenly you have people helping you, not really to invest in your business, but really to build the critical mass for your product in, in that regard. Get the orders for you, get it done, and there is an ecosystem then there to support you to get your product launched. There is websites like, I'm, I have no association with these websites, so I'm referring them from a reference point of view. Or websites like uh, Quirky, for example, where, again, you have a product, someone would help you further design it, someone will help you manufacture it, someone will help you sell it to other retailers. Such kind of infrastructure did not exist 10, 15 years ago. And I think stuff like that, stuff like, yes, Dubai SME and Sheikh Khalil Fund, and I think if they even get more involved with such kind of entities in that regard, I think that's what's really changing from the environment related to entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs at the end of the day are the same today or 15 years ago or 30 years ago, I mean, Jum'a al-Maj, I think, will be speaking soon. I guess he went through the same challenges. Main view, my, my view is, in summary, the infrastructure around entrepreneurs are evolving, and I think entrepreneurs really need to leverage regional infrastructure or global infrastructure today to really get their products out there, to get their services out there in that regard. That's uh, in Thanks a nutshell. A lot. Thanks, Faisal, for kicking us off. So, Chris. Um, a round of applause. There we go. That will attract other people to come into the hall. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Chris, uh, Faisal was talking about infrastructure uh, having been developed. I think you mentioned a lot about technology. It's uh, a lot of technological infrastructure, internet, uh, web-based uh, access to regional global markets. What's your perspective on how entrepreneurs evolved over the last 10 years? Yeah, uh, when I was thinking about, can you hear me okay? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 no, it's good, it's good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. When I was thinking about his wonderful answer, I, I kept coming back from the prism, which I am, which is technology and, and basically consumer-facing technology. And when I think about the last 10 years, I actually really think about the last five to seven because the changes have been so dramatic. And if there was something that I would connect them all together, I would say that we really are in this kind of continuum, an era of sharing. That's how I would tie it all together, which I think is very different in entrepreneurship. So when I started Health Central, which was a social platform where people connected, there was no Facebook when I started it, there was no Twitter when I started it. So it was really all about how people found your website, it was about search, it was about collaboration and blogging that happened there, but it was not about this incredible expression that we have now to reach so many different people with different ideas. We can share our persona, our ideas, our thinking, what am I doing, what am I reading, how does it impact me? This has been an entire revolution 
enabled from technology, but in fact is really very much about human behavior and the interactions that happen in the ecosystem of startups. I think as we've been able to share ideas, we also now have this incredible ability as entrepreneurs to share things. So in the United States, for example, it's very popular to have a company like Zipcar allow anybody to share an automobile wherever they are at any time, leave it somewhere else, someone else picks it up. This has been happening globally with bicycles. It now is every apartment in every house in the United States can be a place for someone to stay in through a company, a startup called Airbnb. You can raise money through Kickstarter. You can raise money through Kiva. This ability to share things and actions, I think, is sort of a second element of it beyond just the idea of ideas. And the other thing, which I think will take this to just an exponential level in the next few years, of course, is that now we can share and collaborate because we have on our person real computing devices. Right? These are not phones anymore. These are truly computers that all of us have, which allow us anytime, any place to be sharers, both in a uh, structured way and an informational way that we have overall. And the net effect of all this, which is probably the biggest change in the last five to seven years, is that with all this technology and collaboration and access to it, the cost of starting a company now is minuscule. It costs almost nothing just to get something up and running and to connect with large amounts of people and to engage both physical products and non-physical products in ways that you never could before. And I think this is incredibly profound in terms of the number of ideas and the number of businesses that will be created about this. And what comes with it, I think, is an incredibly profound change in psychology where everyone with a cell phone now or a mobile device thinks of themselves and they think about their startups really as um, a impact, a social impact as well. I think that the lines in the last five to seven years between classic entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship have been blurring because everyone now has the opportunity not only to build a great business, but takes it as a given that their organization will have an impact or at least the way that they run their business in not a cliched sense, but a real sense of corporate social responsibility is just what entrepreneurs think about as they're thinking about what their great idea is. And so what we're seeing, I guess, is my last observation with all this, and is the most profoundly different change in the last five to seven years, is everything that I've just described is happening now in every corner of the world that you can turn to as long as people have access to this kind of information technology. So you stop and you ask yourself at this wonderful, wonderful event, what are we going to be talking about three years from now? And I will tell you, and a lot of my friends in the mobile business have told me, that 50% of the Middle East will have access to smartphones in the next three years. That's computing devices in people's hands to a very large number in two to three years. So I think everything that I've described that's happened in the last five to seven years is actually only in its earliest days of what's happening, not just in the West, but really everywhere in the world. Thanks a lot, Chris. So I, I want to mention, too, that if at any time any of you want to come in or have a comment, just raise your hand, and, and we'd be very happy to bring you in this discussion. Um, both of you have mentioned the changing landscape <clears throat> facilitated by infrastructure developments very much focused on technology. Um, now, that has it probably, as you've mentioned, Faisal, increased access, increased support systems, allowing entrepreneurs to access new markets. But what's the other side of that medal? I, I was thinking to myself, does it, what impact has that had in terms of uh, competition and competitive landscape because in this world of technology uh, it is also ha it has an intrusive aspect to it it means that your competitors know what you're doing very quickly very fast so in terms of speed in terms of competitive landscape do you or any members of the panel have any remarks to make in terms of how over the last five seven eight years that has affected the way entrepreneurial ecosystems develop Ron. You have a, yes, yes, just get a mic. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. I think there are a couple of things that need to be looked at vis-a-vis uh, -vis competitiveness. In order for an entrepreneur to succeed, the statistics are still very clear. It is imperative for success or to have a good shot at success. It is imperative for success to, that you have a prior job. Statistics have shown that if you haven't worked and you jump into the entrepreneur arena, the odds of your succeeding are much, much lower than if you've actually had a job and worked at a job and understood what that means to come into work every day to be productive, to have a role. Secondly, you have a situation where 
the failure rate is still very high. In the U.S., for instance, only one out of five companies is still alive after two years. And so creating a, a, a company is wonderful, but having a company survive is imperative for growth. The other side of the coin is we have a project in Jordan where we're training women to be entrepreneurs. We didn't plan it that way. We opened it to both genders, but the reality is that women were much less risk adverse than men. And so this course that we've launched, we expected foolishly to be male dominated. And the reality is 80% of the attendees wanting to learn how to be entrepreneurs have are women, and most of them have had prior jobs. If I, if I could jump in, just on, on jumping off of uh, your question and what Chris said about um, the, the, the line is being blurred between social entrepreneurship and, and entrepreneurship, and part of that is the data sharing ability now on Facebook and Twitter, and I think there's, there's two, there's, there's two uh, things in competition here. The one, the one thing is you know, competition on products and information and all that, but I think the flip side of that is also com comp competition in terms of sharing how things are within that institution that you've built in the various companies. And I think it puts a pressure on companies to uh, be fairer to their employees. And I think in the end, that all kind of feeds back into the economy. So I think it's not just about companies competing for on, product, on the product level, but also on the talent level. And I think the, the openness of, uh, of this data sharing um, pushes everyone, and even, even uh, whole institutions and governments towards uh, a democratization. So <clears throat> I'd like to bring in Adil uh, now. And um, uh, you're in a fast moving business as well. Um, and maybe you'll have a comment to make on this uh, technology and pricing and, and, and co com competitive landscape in your business. But I'd also like to, pre as a preamble, ask you um, if you have a view on uh, what Faisal said before he said, it's basically the same thing to be an entrepreneur 10, 15 years ago as it is today. Uh, would you agree with that, or uh, would you see it differently? Thank you. Great. Um, I think let me just get to the technology part of it first. Sure. Um, the technology has uh, certainly in our business uh, brought a lot of pressure on the organization, on the people, uh, but also few years back, it, it used to take six weeks for you to react to a competitor or six weeks to change whatever your pricing structure was. Today, if you have 15 minutes, you're lucky. <laughs> and, and, and that's the speed that has changed. The other side of it is you are so exposed in the business today at before the executive people know what's happening to their business, positive or negative, the rest of the world knows it. So you are got to be, again, very ready to react to that. From the perspective of uh, 10 years back, what entrepreneurs meant in this part of the world in particular and today, I think probably the fear has gone away. Uh, 10 years, 15 years back, th there wasn't something, to be honest, if you ask, 80% of the people on the road about what, what is the definition of what is entrepreneur, they, they wouldn't even say they knew it and they probably went to go to a dictionary because there wasn't uh, a Mr. Google that you can get the, the definition quickly. Uh, today, everybody knows it. There was a, a fear of failure in the past of coming up with a business and if it didn't work, the, the society will not forgive you and you've gone forever. Today, the society encourages you more or less that, yeah, that failed, good try, try again. So there is a much more acceptance for the young people in the room to try, and if it doesn't work, learn from it, learn from it and move forward. From an entrepreneurism point of view, uh, obviously, if, if you want to do such a thing, then if you know you are an entrepreneur, uh, then you're not one. Uh, normally, you don't know if you are an entrepreneur or not. What generally happens is, is if you've got a good business purpose that covers serving the society or the community and people will benefit from it, if you can create a job with your ideas because that's the one uh, 
most dangerous thing that's meeting the society of the Middle East in the next 10 or 15 years. We can't create job, we're going to have problems. So if you are an entrepreneur, think of how can you create more job? And of course, the third key element, if you're doing all that, is can you make some money as a result of that? <laughs> and if you can get those three together and run it successfully, then you are an entrepreneur. Just, um, thanks Adel, just, can we have a show of hands? Yes, we'll come to you right now. A show of hands as to how many people in the room are entrepreneurs. You can just, okay. And just a show of hands in terms of who is more on the entrepreneurial services, support services side. Okay, so about, about a third and two thirds are entrepreneurs, interesting. So we have, I think, um, we don't have another mic, so. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Youssef Shakor. I'm from Morocco. I, I really, I'm an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur. The, the, the debate you're having is fantastic. I would like to just uh, one perspective which is very close to my heart, which is the environment where the entrepreneur evolved. I would say three centuries ago, 10 years, and now. Today, if you imagine the world 10 centuries ago, probably 70% of society were entrepreneurs because they were responsible to bring their food to, ho to their home. There were no, no employment uh, system. 10 years ago, as you were saying, or 15 years ago, entrepreneurship was a luxe. Today, it's mandatory to have more entrepreneurs, to create more value, to create more jobs. We are 7 billion in the planet. Number of entrepreneurs are very small compared to the needs. Everyone wants to have a car, everyone wants to consume. This comes through added value. So today, entrepreneurship is uh, some sort of uh, social act and is becoming more and more mandatory. The ads are coming, of course, but it is because if we don't have more entrepreneurs in the society who will trail the, the, the rest, we are going toward a war, and I would like to have your insights on, on, on this aspect. Uh, first of all, in terms of an entrepreneur succeeding, uh, we've learned that you can actually do an assessment. Uh, manpower has come up with a test that they were using extensively in, of all places, China, and they were able to determine with 96 percent, I know it sounds outrageous, but I've seen it, 96 percent accuracy whether one should be an entrepreneur or not. And it's not a yes or no, it's, it's a whole gradient. And they also are able to tell a budding entrepreneur what they should be doing to increase their odds of success. Secondly, you have an environment now that makes it much easier to be an entrepreneur. Uh, in New Zealand, for instance, $127 in one form and you're in business. Uh, in France, since the meltdown of 2008, regulations have changed radically to enable one to be an entrepreneur. One of the impediments that needs to be looked at, and we talked about risk and failure earlier, is each of, each of the countries that are not as pro-entrepreneur as they could be have to take a look, and I know this isn't an easy thing to talk about, their bankruptcy laws. You know, everybody fails, and we want to know that we're not going to go to jail if we do. And so it's incumbent upon the universe to each country if they want to succeed, if they want to create an environment that enables entrepreneurs to flourish, that they can also have coverage on the downside. If their company in good faith and they haven't committed a fraud, but they've tried hard, but the market, as we all know, is very competitive, doesn't allow them to succeed, they have the ability to move over, dust themselves off, and get on with their lives. That is a key element, and you see it happening, but we do not see it happening universally, and if we're going to create entrepreneurs, uh, an environment that allows them to take the risk, and it's amazing, in the Middle East, uh, we've learned, especially through the program in Jordan, that women are prime candidates, and they hadn't been thought of as entrepreneurs. You talk about changes from 10 years ago. One of the major changes is you see women flourishing in the entrepreneurial field as never before, and it's also, there's been a change in terms of entrepreneurial age, you now have, in the past, in the US anyway, entrepreneurs were primarily people that had worked for a while, they were in their middle age, 
uh, and they came up with an idea and they left the environment of the office. Now you see it flourishing for younger people, middle-aged and older, and I think the trend will continue. Knife, and you want, can we get a mic to a knife? Yeah. And how, how, many, how many of your superheroes are women? Half. 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 There, there, there's 99 of them, so my wife says 50 are going to be women, so there you go. <laughs> um, so not 10 years ago, but because I was a baby 10 years ago, but nine years ago, uh, I, I found myself in Fadi Rendur's office uh, pitching him the 99 and the idea for it, not for money, but just for advice. And um, he sent me to Abraj. And back then, Abraj didn't get involved in startups or SMEs. And one thing I've seen over the, the course of the last 10 years, you know, my first round, one of, the most, one of the questions I got asked the most was, how much money is your father putting in? Why is that relevant? How much money are you putting in? Again, the idea of sweat equity in the GCC, just that wasn't, some, I mean, some, um, some people I'm sure understood it. But when I was trying to raise money back home, uh, that wasn't the concept that was really understood. So it took a while to get investors who understood things like that. 2007, my second round, there was people were throwing money at everything. 2006, 2007, it just didn't matter, right? Now you see kind of the market, the, you know, the, 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 the market kind of, um, you know, more and more things feeding into the ecosystem. So yesterday I heard Osama Fayyad speak in Ras Al Khaima about the, the angel investment climate in Jordan. Something that's very, very impressive. Qatar just launched an initiative with Silla, also angel investing. Um, you have the SME funds that are stopping up. Wamda with the start, with the with in, in getting involved in early stage. So that's that's what's new now. Uh, but again, the, the, I think the big thing that's missing um, is the education component. I mean, for me, you know, the, the role models that I looked up to when I was studying were books I read in the U.S. about U.S. entrepreneurs. Right now, I think you know there are more and more books coming. I'm looking forward to Chris's. I've been able to see at least one chapter of it. But I think books like that will get people kind of say, "Hey, I can do this too," and I think that's something that's missing. And I think that's what the next 10 years will have more and more role models. I mean, people who actually build something successful and then retire, <gasps> like Fadi did. Right? That's new. So, <clears throat> Fadi is in the room, and I think he's asking for the mic. Thank you, thank you, uh, Nayef. Uh, my, I have a couple of points, but maybe I'd, I'd like your your reaction to it. Um, the problem with with how entrepreneurship is being viewed today is 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 a conceptual issue. You know, it's sexy, it's nice, people talk about it, entrepreneurship, 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 which is great. Um, in my view, we need to demystify it and, and bring it down to earth a little bit so that we, uh, we don't think that this is like uh, rocket science here. In my view, in today's world, today's, exactly today's world, entrepreneurship uh, is about uh, doing two things. One, uh, creating new wealth that is outside, especially here in the region, that is outside the uh, traditional uh, a historical way of doing money, either through uh, land, inheritance, or oil. So that there is uh, this sense of empowerment among the individual here that he is uh, economically independent so that he can express himself as an individual uh, outside of the realm of, of, of the, uh, the uh, ever-loving uh, uh, state and, and government. So one needs to think about that. Number two, uh, it is about creating jobs. I mean, we, don't, we need to forget a little bit about Peter Drucker's quotations where he says entrepreneurship is about doing things differently and stuff like that. I love Peter Drucker, I think he's great, but entrepreneurship today is about creating jobs. Very simple. If, if an entrepreneur does not create jobs, then there is a problem in society today. Thank you. Thanks, Fadi. And you know, I think bridging what our Moroccan friend said with what you said, Fadi, with uh, also what Naif was saying, <clears throat> certainly when we, from our perspective as investors, as we see the growth um, more and more coming from what we call global growth markets, emerging markets, which the Middle East and the Arab world is definitely a part of, and as we see a growing consumer class that was mentioned also, 
and um, the need for, um, uh, for 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 more in, for more investments into not only um, large infrastructure projects, whether they be education, roads, airports, but also into entrepreneurial ecosystems uh, and entrepreneurs themselves, because they are, as Fadi said. Um, they are those that create the jobs that these uh, emerging markets need, particularly when you take into consideration the common characteristic that they all have, which is this youth bulge uh, and, uh, and this increasing uh, demand for having dignity and a job opportunity moving forward. And I think we're seeing a lot of talent, a lot of entrepreneurial uh, um, uh, zeal coming out of uh, today's youth and all the markets in which we operate and I th and I wanted to bridge in the time that we now have we've, we've spent sort of half of the time speaking about how matters have evolved I think it would be interesting to try and speak about how do the next what do the next 10 years look like uh, in terms of entrepreneurship in, in in this part of the world education was mentioned uh, as one of the great sort of gaps that still needs to be uh, fulfilled and I see Sulaf here uh, from uh, Injaz Al Arab. Uh, I see Hala Fadel, who's here from the, the MIT Business Competition Plan. Um, if th if matters are evolving the way they are, I think Injaz did a survey of Arab youth, asking uh, the youth, "How many of you plan to start your own businesses?" And I think the percentage was only eight percent answered that question positively. So we're definitely not where we should be when it comes to having created that entrepreneurial ecosystem. Sulaf, go, yeah, you want to make a comment on that? Just wait, we'll get you a mic. Uh, the survey did have 8% uh, of the students who participated, and we're talking about 250,000 students annually that go through the INJAZ program across MENA. So 8% actually said that they would be thinking about starting a business. However, after taking a, a program, even if it's a one-day program like the Innovation Day Camp or the company program, the result went up to 82%. So when you target youth between the age of 15 and 21, and you give them an exposure to the idea of entrepreneurship, the rate will actually go up. I'm not sure how many of them will succeed but the acceptance rate will go up. Okay, thanks, Sulaf. So, Adel? I just wanted to ask a question to Sulaf. Were those 250,000 people across the board of all sorts of children in public and private schools, or were they uh, a specific private or public? Well, in, in Jazz, in Arab, or in, in the MENA region, is growing in different stages. So you have Jordan that's covering 100,000 students annually. And you have Yemen that just started two years ago that's covering about 1,000 students. So the majority of students are in what we call underserved Arabic-speaking schools. So these tend to be government schools or private schools in the UAE that don't offer entrepreneurial programs. So we focus on um, government uh, schools mainly, public schools. Th th thank you. And I, I think that the, 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 the view I had there was um, there are two, two groups of people in the Arab world. Uh, generally, from a parent's point of view, everybody who can afford it wants their children in a private school because there is very little trust in the public school. Uh, most of the public schools tend to still run 1950s education curriculums, which are not valid for 2020 or 2010. So I think if, if we're really interested in, in that, that in terms of creating a future generation responsible for running businesses and making businesses, that's the foundation where you need the, the education side changes. However, if you ask in a private school, and, and uh, most of students you find their ambitions is to either become very successful in existing companies or want to run their own businesses. Very interesting also, I don't know if a survey has been conducted or not, is 
if you're in a public school, you tend to learn more sitting at home, going it through internets and watching TV nowadays than the school. So again, we need to use that, but teach people at home. Sometimes can be better nowadays than going to schools at some time. And you wouldn't have traffic jams on the roads. You know, key to being a successful entrepreneur is having the basic skills. Uh, when we started operating in the Middle East, the first thing we were told to do, I remember uh, I was in Jordan, and I met with Khalid Tukan, who was the education minister, brilliant man, MIT graduate, and I said, Khalid, if we could do one thing and just one thing, what could we do, what should we do? And he said, soft skills. And quite frankly, it didn't resonate at that point in time, but having seen the impact of soft skills, it's critical. So we built a course teaching youth. We built it with McGraw-Hill, teaching youth everything from how to write a resume to critical thinking to team building to leadership to public speaking to how to dress. And what came out of that was, it's a three-month course, but what came out of it was more powerful than the sum of the parts. The kids, when they left our program, had self-confidence. And I think a key element for success of an entrepreneur is you need a level of self-confidence to start off with. And you also need the basic skills. I was at a graduation about two months ago at uh, Bank Misser in Cairo, and we had, pro we had done a pilot with them. We brought kids from what they thought was a demographic that was unacceptable to them. So we trained 100 kids in soft skills, work skills, as well as basic banking. These kids took themselves and they divided themselves into four groups, came up with four methods for the bank to make more money. The bank was astounded. This is what is needed. You know, I'm, uh, it's a much broader macro observation for a man who doesn't know very much and has been very blessed to be here for the first time in the last couple of years. But it seems to me that a tremendous amount of time is spent at a lot of these gatherings that I go to about all the problems and all the challenges, real as they are. Um, I think Fadi touched on something very poor, which very important before, which is almost about the psychology of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial ecosystems and taking a lot of the mystery out of it, it's unbelievably important. I mean, the fact is, if we were all sitting here 20 years ago and had a conversation, none of us would have thought that a wood products company would be one of the leaders of mobile telephones, but that's what Nokia was. Nokia was a wood products company who switched and became the largest provider of mobile devices in the world. If we had this conversation 20 years ago, there's no way on earth we would have thought that someone out of Korea would effectively be giving an apple for the run, but probably half of you have Samsung devices on your person now. If we sat here 20 years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be in the desert. And, and so it's very interesting to me that these problems are incredibly important, and they're going to take time to be addressed. But in the middle, stuff is happening anyways. And what is so exciting to me, everywhere in the world, not just in the Middle East, that it's bottom up. People are looking around and effectively saying, the new generation of entrepreneurs are saying, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to go at something now. And if education's a problem, then I'm going to figure out something that's going to complement the aspects to the best with which I have now, which is, to me, the greatest sign of a very healthy ecosystem, if there is. I have not yet, I interviewed for this book, I'm not a journalist, but I interviewed for this book, one-on-one, -on -one, over 116 young entrepreneurs. And not one of them, first of all, told me that they thought they were an entrepreneur. Their first reaction was, I had a great idea, I had to get it done, I figured out how to get it done. It was not until later that someone put that label onto them. So it was really all about action in very powerful ways. And I can tell you, second, I have never met a young entrepreneur who ever told me they thought twice of starting a company because of the bankruptcy laws. Now, rule of law is unbelievably important. Knowing that you have ownership in something is important. The flow of capital is important. But I think a lot of times, while those things need to be solved, people miss that there's a broader thing happening bottom up which I think is going to have much larger ramifications over time. I think we have a comment from the audience. Thanks, Chris. Hi, my name is Ibrahim Tadros. Um, that, well, my question was really touching on what you, just, what you just mentioned, which is the bankruptcy laws. I mean, that's one example, but there are other examples about the whole ecosystem that you're, that you're in that will allow you to succeed or not. I mean, Ron touched on the point that uh, one out of five businesses succeed. Well, I think given the right infrastructure, more w should, but given the, given the giving hindering, hindering infrastructure, uh, the, the, the inhibitions that potential entrepreneurs have would be much higher. So, I mean, where do we see ourselves here? And the, the question is, where do we see ourselves here in the region? 
in terms of if I want to start a company tomorrow or if I want to start, if I have an idea I want to start it, I will fear starting it because of bankruptcy laws or regulatory role laws or any other form of laws. So what is the way around those that would at least try and push down those barriers? I, I don't want to trivialize these very real issues and they become more important as you compete against other countries that don't have them. And the earlier observation that the internet and technology makes every company in a way a global company means that there is disadvantage in here. But I would bet you if Sami Tukan were sitting here, he would tell you two things. He would tell you there are real issues, and second is tough. I'm, I'm going to work around them because that's what you do, and I'm going to work them through. And then success ends up breeding success, and hopefully the bubbling up success will get people to focus on some of these top-down issues. I have to tell you personally what concerns me more, as an out again, take this with a grain of salt, is an outsider, is that I think that the internet is the platform of our time. Very often we think about the internet as a freedom of speech issue, which it is also, and it's a means of communication. But for me, the internet is actually about the future economic platform of our time. And I actually get much more worried when people, not just here, but in other parts of the world, are trying to take steps to think that they can somehow or other hone in that platform when the rest of the world is stepping in. In this case, it's not so much about regulation that has to be fixed as it is future forward-thinking policymakers saying, I've got to think about this differently. Because once the platform was capital, the platform is still capital, but now the, co the platform of economic growth and development in B2C and B2B in all areas is access to something whose by its definition is based upon openness and transparency. But in the meantime, entrepreneurs like you just have to keep building. Faisal. Yes. I guess from, I mean, to tag along with what just been mentioned, I guess for any entrepreneurial environment, there are few key ingredients. And I'll mention the headlines and which ones do I think at the end of the day are the critical ones today. I mean, at the end of the day, they're not all the same. Whether it is awareness, whether awareness through events like this or education or uh, like the events that happen in, in Dubai Mall for the small entrepreneur, that's an important ingredient. Whether it's regulation or how can I issue my license or whether it's bankruptcy, whatever, yes, that's important. Funding at the end of the day, is the, you don't have a business if there is no funding in general at the end of the day. And last is the ingredient of the person himself. Does he have it in him to really do what it takes to go around? Because there will always be roadblocks. Now, from these ingredients, the ones I think are the ones the most crucial in that regard, yes, you definitely have the awareness and the education. And partly there's a short gain, i.e. you could do it in the short run, and partly is a longer term uh, exercise. End of the day, I think the most important ingredient other than the individual person himself being someone that wants to do something, finding better, easier ways, more efficient ways to raise funding. At the end of the day, the way I see it is this. You have a variety of businesses. You could, uh, uh, if, if I look at the, uh, the infrastructure out there today, whether you go to banks or you go to angel funds or you go to some of the private funds or your relatives or whatever, in my view, that's a bottleneck. It's a funnel that you're trying to go through in that regard. And if you have 80 people, 80% that are interested to go out, guess what? These 80% can't go through that funnel. In my view, that funnel is too narrow in, in that regard. And hence, I think uh, on what's mentioned in terms of really leveraging the internet and how it's been evolving, a number of years ago, a small website called YouTube started. YouTube is contributed through people like us. We are the contributors into YouTube. I mean, I know today the buzzword is the crowd and sourcing the crowd and whatever. But end of the day, it's the crowd that's been populating that content. Today, that has evolved into the sites that I mentioned, like Kickstart or QWERTY or whatever, where I think at the end of the day, there are, yes, there are people that have big ideas for big businesses. But there are many people that have many small, at least they will start as very small and tiny ideas in, in that regard, which frankly might not be able to go through the funnel of talking to a private equity house or X or Y or Z because it will collapse. 
but maybe it has the potential a bit down the line. And I think leveraging the net, leveraging how risk can go down. Today, if a private equity house has to invest, they're looking at it as a large investment, high risk, yeah, maybe high return. But if you go through the current sites where Ali has an idea for a product, and all he needs is, rather than trying to convince an investor to fund them for 100,000, all he needs is 1,000 guys agreeing to pay 100 dirham for his product. 1,000 guys to pay 100 dirham for his product is, in my view, 10 times easier than convincing someone to pay him 100,000. I think it's through leveraging that phenomena that's growing. You'll create many smaller entities that are growing. And I'm, I'm sure at the end of the day, that kind of an ecosystem is not the infrastructure for all kinds of business plans. But I think we need to widen that, and I think that's where there is a massive bottleneck in, in that regard. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, you're, you're generating um, a lot of discussion here. I, I see the organizers jumping up and down saying, we've got to close. So I'm going to ask Adil and uh, Naif, you were asking for the mic, if you can weave in some closing comments, just one or two minutes each, and then we'll have to stop. Uh, Thank you. We were just my, getting started, my, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. Mine will be extremely short, but I just want to assure the gentleman over there that uh, when you come to asking people for money uh, and it's a new business, people tend to look at half glass empty. And just to share my own experience, um, when I wanted to set up our business, there wasn't a single aviation expert in the Arab world who told me that we will succeed. The most I was given that we will survive for six months, and the, the less optimistic people said three months. And next year, we're going to be 10 years, a $15 million is $1.2 billion. I think just just uh, just a final comment going back on the statistic that was brought up that within a few years one one only one out of five businesses succeed and four fail I think the, the missing part of that is actually the economy succeeds because let's, let's not forget that all five of those companies in those few years created jobs and that takes a big burden off of whatever government is providing for so I think it's very important to keep that that yes a part of it might be failure but overall creating these companies leads to success Chris Ron what do you want to see, see happening over the next 10 years in this region? Um, coming back 10 years from now, looking back 10 years, what do you want to see have happened? I guess, firstly, I want to see an environment where the youth have the skills, the basic work skills so they can succeed in the, in the workplace. And I mentioned earlier, we teach, teach soft skills, and that has been a key element. So often we meet youth, and they don't have any idea, they don't have self-confidence, they don't have the basic skills, they don't have self-confidence. They don't understand what it takes to succeed. It can be taught. We've seen in three months a radical change. Secondly, we do need an environment where it is easier to set up, maintain, and operate a business. The Middle East traditionally has not had that. It's moving in the right direction. Uh, I was in Cairo recently, and despite the Arab Spring, it's become extremely difficult for an entrepreneur in Egypt at the moment to start a new business, which is not helpful. I am more hopeful than I am optimistic in life, but I have to tell you, 10 years from now, we're gonna come back here in my very strong view, and it's happening anyway. It's just happening anyway. And the access to technology, and I think people's unbelievable passion to be able to actualize and create their dreams is something that can't be put back away. So I feel very confident about that. Chris, when is your book coming out? This so the, the book is probably coming out in early September, though it's possible early June. And it's called Startup Rising, kind of a play on the word, but it's all about startups in the Middle East and the ramifications not only to society but for global innovation. So thank there you. you. Go. So some free advertising to end this session. Thank you very much to you, our panel, and um, a good continuation on the summit over the next day. <laughs>